Hey friends, Andrew here, hope you're well. The new M3 MacBooks were launched only 10 months after the M2 came to market. That's as fast as these chipsets are. So I had a thought. My main workhorse, which is this M2 Max MacBook Pro, it's still more powerful than 99% of laptops out there. So you might be thinking, well, what's the point of upgrading? But what if the new M3 Pro here was both faster and more affordable than my M2 Max. Well, after one month with the 14 inch MacBook M3 Pro, here is my full honest review and Apple's strategy here is not what I thought it would be. So let's start with the things that are new to the M3 MacBook that I've experienced over the last month. The display has received a noteworthy upgrade. It's been bumped up from 500 nits to 600 nits, so an almost 20% jump. In day-to-day -day use, it makes it slightly easier to work in really bright ambient light or outside indirect sunlight. So I have seen a usable difference there, but nothing game-changing though. Everything else about the mini LED display remains unchanged over two generations now, still an amazing display for all lines of work and even gaming, but more on that later. The other obvious new draw card is the new space black color, which I jumped for immediately. Like a lot of you, I love the color black for my tech and I've been waiting for a black colored MacBook. But unfortunately, as you might be able to see already, I feel like space black is an Apple marketing term. It's not nearly as dark as the product shots make it out to be. And depending on time of day, lighting, and what it's sitting next to as a point of comparison, it looks more like a slightly darker shade of space gray. In fact, it seems lighter than my midnight colored M2 MacBook Air, which I still love and use daily. But yeah, as you can see here, the midnight color has a nicer, darker hue in my opinion. So if like me you were hoping for a jet black macbook this isn't it just yet apple did do a great job though making space black far more fingerprint resistant than the midnight macbook air that's thanks to an apparent new anodization process um, after about seven days of use though, I did start to see some serious fingerprints and smudges, but that's to be expected even with Apple's new anodization process. Overall, great color to have for dark mode lovers. It's just not as dark as product renders. So the real worthy change here is the M3 chipset. You don't need another person to tell you Apple Silicon is fast. We already know it's really fast. But like I said, the real reason I chose to to buy the 14 inch M3 Pro is to see if it's able to replace my 14 inch M2 Max with technically what is a more affordable MacBook a generation later, the M3 Pro. And after one month of use, I guess this is the part that surprised me. The M3 Pro is on par, if not noticeably faster than my M2 Max MacBook. It's surprising not because my M2 Max cost almost a whole $1,000 more at launch, but because the M3 Pro is doing more with less. You see, the CPU core layout has changed for the M3 with a now equal amount of performance and efficiency cores, six and six, whereas previously in my M2 Max, it has eight performance cores and four efficiency. That's fascinating. Yet on the Geekbench multi-core test, I've recorded a score of 15,118 on the M2 Max and 15,435 on the M3 Pro, and almost a doubling in single core performance. So in some ways, this generation's Pro is the last generation's Max only 10 months later. And a big reason for this leap in performance is the smaller three nanometer fabrication technology. So in less technical words, Apple has managed to cram more transistors into a smaller space, which means it's able to perform more simultaneous tasks at a faster rate or while using less power. And I've been seeing this translate nicely into real life scenarios. Exporting a large 14 minute 4K video on Final Cut Pro took about five minutes, 30 seconds on the M2 Max, while it exported in just four minutes, 45 seconds on the M3 Pro. 
similar numbers on Premiere Pro 2 and these numbers are surprising. I didn't expect the M3 Pro to destroy my M2 Max. Exporting and editing multiple 60 megapixel Leica RAWs simultaneously is really rapid too with zero stutter. Basically everything my M2 Max is able to do, which is practically everything in my workflow, the M3 Pro can handle no problem at all and if not improve on those workflow speeds. So the M3 Pro is really, really good. And what about the M3 Max then? Well, that leap is even larger. Its processing power is now equal to my M2 Ultra Mac Studio. Both devices cost an arm and a leg though, and that's the reason why I personally didn't, didn't go for the M3 Max and went for the M3 Pro instead. But between the new M3 MacBook lineup, the jump in performance from Pro to Max is now a lot more profound this generation than it ever has been. So it sort of incentivizes us to choose the Max variant over the Pro. The other new element that the M3 chip brings is dynamic caching and hardware accelerated ray tracing. This means the M3 Mac is capable of playing plenty of different games, but when it comes to looking for a game I genuinely want to play and test, it was slim pickings and it's been uh, unfortunately pretty tough to find a game that I want to actually play on the Mac. I browse through Mac games on Steam and the pickings are so poultry and the list of Rosetta enabled games is longer but mainly filled with older stuff. And therein lies the biggest hurdle for Apple to become a true gaming laptop. The Mac needs to match consoles and gaming PCs when it comes to the selection of games. Earlier, Apple did announce the game porting toolkit to help incentivize game devs to port their games over to Mac, but we're yet to see real progress there. So the bottom line with Mac gaming is Apple definitely has the hardware, the M3, especially the Pro and the Macs, are capable of running high-end games. It now just needs the games. When I was doing some research, I also saw some reports on M3 MacBooks shipping with the older Mac OS Ventura, which is fascinating because it shows just how long these laptops were completed and sitting in a warehouse prior to Sonoma's release in September. And that also shows that you can't take leaks and rumors too seriously. But yeah, using Sonoma over the last month on the M3 Pro, it's proved to be a great package and an operating system that helps take advantage of the extra power. So Sonoma brings a whole bunch of new capabilities like interactive widgets, new video conferencing tools, and Safari improvements, things like that. It's been a really pleasant and snappy OS to use on my M3 MacBook, and Sonoma looks more like an iPhone than ever. I personally don't think it's a bad thing. The lock screen is pretty beautiful, and it's been revamped. System settings is laid out vertically like an iPhone, and I use widgets more than ever now. I've got mine scattered all over my desktop. And I'll also leave a video in the description link down below on the 14 must change Sonoma settings if you're interested in that. So when it comes to real life usage and which M3 variation to get, here is my experience and my two cents. I still use my MacBook M2 Air day to day for business as usual tasks, emails, web browsing, scripting, easy things like that, it's absolutely perfect for. But as soon as I need to edit videos, photos, PDF, Figma files, or just have more than 10 tabs open, particularly on Chrome, I reach for the larger and heavier MacBook Pro M3. There's a big noticeable difference in operating power. It's also worth mentioning Apple has retired the 13 inch MacBook Pro in favor of the 14 inch MacBook Pro base configuration. But before you do consider buying the base model, I have to say, as soon as you upgrade a single thing on the base M3, the M3 Pro is right there at a decent price point. Nowadays, you will find it pretty difficult to operate on eight gigabytes of RAM if you design graphics, develop games, edit videos, or handle machine learning workflows. Eight gigabytes is just not enough anymore. But geez, after over a month with the MacBook Pro M3, there is a lot of value for money here still. 
The gains may not be as mind-blowing as when the M1 first arrived, but do not sleep on the M3. Let me know if you're making the upgrade to the M3 family of MacBooks or if you already have how you're finding your new MacBook. I think it's both incredible and scary that the Pro variant offers the same performance as my M2 Max only nine months later, nine to 10 months later. It's a reminder of just how fast these generational iterations are moving. So it's only worth investing into a machine that suits your needs and that you'll hang on to for a while. After all, the M4 is just around the corner anyway. If you enjoyed this review, don't forget to drop the video a like and comment the code word BMW M3, especially if you're a car enthusiast. I'll share my video right here to my review of the Mac Studio M2 Ultra. That's still my main desktop workhorse I love. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.